Globus. Up to Good you. morning, everyone. Um, delighted to see a full room. This is fantastic. Now, for those of you that don't know Paul and Su Ming, who are very famous in their own worlds, their bios are on page 37 and 90, so you can check them out. Uh, but I'm delighted to be here with CEOs and chairmen that I think cumulatively represent at least 120 years of business experience in Asia, as I've added up since you all graduated from college and doing what you are. So with that, I was going to ask each of the gentlemen to maybe say a quick word about this, this question, which is where is growth from Asia going to come from? What's the first word that comes to your mind? And I'll go left to right. Thanks, Miki. Um, the first word is services. Um, coming from Australia, I think the, the maturing economies in, Aust in, in Asia, there's a growing need for consumption of services, both internally and externally. So Australia has always benefited from services in terms of education, tourism, financial. So Miki, I, I, I think I'll pause there. Thank you. Thank you. Frank? Well, um, the word I'm not using here and the content is Europe. I'm based in Europe. I won't talk about Europe. I'm not a strong believer in growth in Europe, but I believe in Asia. And Asia really um, is the growth engine. It has been the growth engine for the last uh, 10, 20 years. Uh, of course, China. And I would say growth in China is here to stay, despite the fact that um, growth is going down to eventually uh, six, five percent. Uh, I believe that um, China will be able to um, refocus um, its uh, growth initiatives towards innovation, and it's my buzzword, or the first buzzword. Uh, the second buzzword I would like to mention is wealth creation. Now, with so many entrepreneurs coming in across Asia, the question is, uh, what are you doing with your wealth, and how to sustain your wealth, and um, how to engage even in philanthropy, uh, helping societies to prosper. I mentioned China. Uh, I would like to mention another country, which is India. I very much believe in India as a new growth engine, a new growth story. Uh, Prime Minister Modi um, has a very decisive uh, approach of revamping the Indian economy, of course, still of um, red tape and bureaucracy. Uh, but now, slowly and steadily, we see growth happening in India. China, India, innovation, wealth creation, that was four words, Frank. Sorry for that. <laughs> <laughs> but those are all excellent words, and we'll come back to mo most of them, if not all. Um, yeah, I feel very honored and uh, a little bit embarrassed to, to sit in front of such a distinguished people. And I can, all I can tell to you today is uh, through my experience of day-to-day -day operation of my company, uh, making uh, automation <coughs> equipment. The key word, talking about uh, growth in Asia, for me, will be uh, automation. And growing engine of <coughs> Asia, including China, used to be the uh, uh, labor cost, I think, of the manufacturing sector. And even today, the uh, manufacturing sector in China and Asia is a uh, core of the local economy, just like it used to be in Pennsylvania, a small town. But the uh, demography is changing, and the aging society, and uh, less, it's difficult even in China to find uh, uh, operation people in factory floor. So automation and safety, in security automation will be one of the key word for the growth, further growth in Asia, I believe. Thank you. Thank you. I know it, uh, only in Japan, I think, versus, say, Germany, you picked up about Europe. If we talk about automation and people not needed, it's a positive news story in Japan. It's a negative story in Germany, and so we'll come back to that um, in terms of labor arbitrage and the uh, trends in automation. And Paul, last but not least, one word. Disruption. Great word. I think the entire economy of Asia will be disrupted just as the global economy will be. And it is the biggest threat and it's the biggest opportunity. So we will see the digitization of the economies and blockchain and more important to unleash entrepreneurial talent in the future as Hori San understands very well at Globus. And uh, we need to change the way we think as business leaders and use Asia's youth and dynamic economy to our advantage in the age of disruption. Fantastic. So well, why don't we pick up on that in terms of disruption, technology, what companies, countries, sectors do you see utilizing technology in that sort of way? 
you, many of you are investors. Some of you operate your own companies. Some of you do both. What are the signals you look for in terms of technology being used in that sort of way? I see the rise of um, regional centers in Asia. It's no longer just a country approach, but we see cities and regions. For example, Shenzhen. Shenzhen in China is like a new Silicon Valley. Bangalore in India. Uh, in Japan, we see cities like Tsukuba, the science city, and we see linkages uh, across uh, the region, across countries. Uh, nurturing talent, so disruption is important, um, but also stability is important, as you see in the Japanese context. So we need to balance disruption and stability, uh, and uh, and see, you know, maybe a way in between how to use disruption to stabilize societies. Paul, were you going to jump in? Yeah, I I think it's very interesting, but we're going to have different centers of gravity, and I think with the new economy, we're going to have countries that embrace this technology and lead, and we're going to have wider gaps with those countries which are still too traditional economically. So the gap between the countries of Asia, I think, will widen in some ways, especially with TPP out. But, but I think that, like Singapore now, as costs go up, Singapore has to become a virtual orchestration center. So they're looking, as a smart city, how to use technology, integrate, but a lot of what Singapore does will actually happen outside of Singapore. And as Frank said, I'm a big believer in India's future. Yes, it can be challenging and bureaucratic, but they just changed their whole uh, currency policy, which was a very bold move. So I, I think India will have the technology centers popping up, as Shenzhen does as well, um, but it's also going to have the e-commerce coming up. Um, so we're going to have different centers of gravity, more cities than countries, actually. Interesting, uh, I think the disruption is, is quite broad. Um, in my investment sort of activities, the disruption that we see both comes from technology and also from government risk. In Australia, for example, one of the growth drivers have been for us for the last 10 years has been the export of fresh protein sources to China. <coughs> and that's been disrupted because the Chinese government will impose regulation out of left field that you didn't anticipate, suddenly a uh, 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 darling of the stock market overnight lost 30% of its value because of regulation has stopped the flow of milk powder going to China. So that's what disruption is something I personally, for me as an investor, all I can instill in my management team, my business partners, is that be ready for disruption and try to down, you know, sort of minimize your downside. And, and political risk is something that we are constantly aware of, apart from the te 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 technological risk that we see. And just another perspective from Australia is that we're not going to see the moonshots. We're not going to see the Google coming out of Australia. So we try to adapt to what's growing globally and use it to the best of our advantages. Just uh, lifting off of your China comment, we've done some work that suggests that by 2021, I think, 90% of purchases in China will be digitally influenced by some way. Not directly commerce, although they're way ahead of many countries, even developed countries. Perhaps you can comment on that, and we can have yeah. an interesting debate. Uh, uh, you uh, and uh, yes, after Ms. Sumin and Mr. Murase, oh, I want oh. I don't have any insight to, to, to add to that, Miki. All I can say is that I live it. Yes. We, we have a, <laughs> a retail brand in Australia called Lorna Jane, which is an active wear for the ladies who might know it. It's an Australian answer to Lululemon. And we established ourselves in China purely online. Is that right? 100%. And, in, and in the last two years, Lorna Jane's China operation is now the biggest contribution of profit to, us, now to Lorna Jane. And we don't have a store. We only do it online. Interesting. So China really is online. If you think about mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the online business, like, for example, taxi services, um, you know, everybody is using the Didi uh, in China. Uh, in the good old days, you just flag down your taxi, and I think um, China is uh, very advanced. Even uh, there's a higher use in, in rural China than in some parts of California, and um, all the payments now are done online in China. So really, like, the, the physical currency is, is, in a way, running out, and, of course, uh, fighting corruption. Right, the more cash uh, is in the system, the more corrupt it might be. India is trying to do the same thing with demonetization, 
and it's the right way to go. Of course, a huge risk. Uh, India is losing growth maybe two percentage point this year mm -hmm. with demonetization. Uh, talking about your point, uh, uh, political risk, and um, I should mention that um, despite all the hope in the room and the optimism, uh, there's also risk, and you can never differentiate um, uh, the economy from geopolitics. And of course, as uh, you know, the big elephant in the room here is uh, on the one hand Korea but also the, the China-Japanese angle and the China-Indian angle, and there's a lot of competition happening here. China now with this uh, One Belt, One uh, Road um, initiative, the New Silk Road, is spurring growth, uh, growth across the region um, uh, to Central Asia and onwards to Europe. Um, India uh, might try to do something similar using the concept of the spice route, and uh, Japan and India is starting to collaborate in Africa. So we see more growth happening, maybe using and filling the void. Uh, Mr. Trump is uh, <laughs> leaving here with, uh, you know, TPP is, is no longer in place. And uh, so there will be new alliances happening, and it's good for growth. Okay. So I'd like to come back to geopolitics and us in business and how we think about that. But I know that you two gentlemen wanted to get into yeah. on digitization, digitalization. Yeah, we region, can just talk yeah. about this for 40 more minutes too, actually. But okay. please, yeah. one comment each. As a each. region of the growth, uh, since I'm a Japanese, I'd like to list Japan as a potential place That's for right. the growth. The and third uh, largest economy in the world, please. Used to be when the Japan the used to be the uh, number one in the uh, consumer appliances. The Japanese uh, high level of the demand of the consumers supported uh, development and product. And today, we face the uh, very, very demanding factory owners in Japan, especially in the security and safety of the machines. And sometimes it works. Very, very important to keep the machines running years and years in very good condition, especially in the full automation. And that's very basic. It's not a fancy and not a high tech, but that kind of day-to-day ability to maintain and keep the machines a service, that is a very important. And in Japan, it's a very good place to make that kind of uh, expertise. And it can be exported to the other countries like India, China, in the future. Yes. Uh, we'll come back to that as well. I know 60% of your Thank business you. is outside yes. of Japan, uh, but you have very strong business here as well. Paul? Yeah, just two minutes. So one, politically, yeah, now you're seeing the Silk Road connecting many countries, the new Silk Road. You're also seeing the non-Silk Road. You're seeing Japan partner more with Vietnam. Very significant when you're in Vietnam. With India, with Abe San's trip to India this week, right? So there's, there's a lot of dynamic changes. The aggressiveness with the nine dashes, the South China Sea, has actually changed the whole uh, capital flow in many ways to encourage more manufacturing in the ASEAN region, as an example, where it was too heavy in China. So that's one area. But, but I wanted to tie back. We've been led in, in Asia by large companies. Japan is a great example, right? And uh, Korea as well. But we're now in an era where the economy is going to be driven by the small disruptors and, and, and then how you absorb that technology. So we need to encourage much more entrepreneurship. In most of our countries, SMEs make up 80, 85 percent of the jobs. But we give so much attention politically to the, the large companies that create 10 to 15 percent of the jobs. So I think the real opportunity in Asia coming up, including Japan, but across the region, is how do we now encourage the small medium enterprises? You have a wonderful, you're a wonderful example, how you've built the company and transformed. And, and how do we take these SMEs that create most of the economic wealth, link them with new entrepreneurs, the disruptors, and use that to transform and, and really take advantage of the economic potential of Asia. So I, I think this is a critical area that we need to drive in the next five, five years especially. I want to do a quick audience poll there on your point about entrepreneurship and small and medium-sized corporates to large. And I know there are many backgrounds here, but if you can just raise your hand if you were more trained operating in the big business world versus medium and small. I'd just love to get a sense of the audience before mm -hmm. Sumin talks. So big business, large corporates. Raise your hand. Hi, it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> and small and medium, 
Entrepreneurs, okay. Ah, That's who comes on Monday on a holiday in Japan. Excellent. I like that. I like that. That's my audience. <laughs> I know you wanted to talk about small and medium companies, and you also wanted to comment on uh, India versus China as well. You might take the right. opportunity. I'll, I'll, I'll take the India and China sort of question out of the way, okay. and then Frank and I can have a debate after okay, lunch. That, <laughs> I, 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 as an investor, took most in, of our in, briefing in, sessions. So go ahead, in, please. In, most of my investment is in the medium size or smaller. So we invest about 30 to 60 million Australian dollars into Australian companies that's growing. And that's why you have a funny accent investor in Australian company because I, I was born in Asia and my investment philosophy has always been investing in Australian company that exports to the world, but mainly into Asia because of our geographical proximity to Asia. And it's hard for Australian company to export to Asia because Asia is really a conglomerate of different nations and cultures. And the white Caucasian Australian tends to think of one Asia. So I have to train them for a long, long time to think differently. So SMEs is ham, ham, hamstrung. Paul is right. In, it's the same in Australia. I'll call you the same statistics. 80% of the jobs, employments are done by SMEs in Australia. And yet, the support they get is very restricted because of their scale. And I'll come back again. There's so much thing to talk about. For example, the, the corporate, the, the, one of the growth drivers for me is to link Asian SMEs with Australian SMEs to target, to share each other's strength. Australia with their services and their know-how, their IP. Asian SME with their knowledge and on the ground. We create a lot of winners that way. So I'll stop that. Because it's just one point on the Please. SMEs, and um, as we are in Asia, we should mention that most companies actually run by families, mm -hmm. like the overseas Chinese, the Huaqiao, or the non-resident Indians, the NI, uh, investing all across uh, Asia. And it's maybe the strength uh, of the SME concept, saying, you know, it's a family behind, it's not a listed company, it's not a large uh, company, uh, but a lot of, you know, um, smaller ones. And now there are a lot of... Um, uh, first generation companies coming up, startups, maybe with American, Australian capital, venture capital. Uh, and it's really the, the strengths Asia should maintain, those networks, uh, the SME uh, environment. Uh, of course, at one stage, you have to go towards a more like um, maybe Western or like um, um, Anglo-Saxon model. Um, where you say, you know, you list your company, but should always preserve the um, vision of uh, long-term um, Asian-style capitalism, um, where arm's-length relationships are not so important, but more like the family element, and definitely, you know, the, the SME, SME uh, environment, which is very prone to uh, disruption, where you can innovate, and we, we can move very fast and quickly. Any other comments on SMEs? Yeah, in my... Uh, business. Yes. Uh, I'm in, the, by the way, the family business. I'm in the third generation, 80 years old company. Mm -hmm. And uh, we started as a textile machinery manufacturer. And uh, used to be, at that time, a competitors in, in the States in Abbott technology. Abbott used to be, the, by the way, the textile machinery manufacturer at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And we licensed from them. But later on, the, uh, those American companies shifted the focus to the other more growing sector, like semiconductor, electricity and they just left the textile machinery field. And today, the uh, majority of a major player of textile machinery is located in Europe and uh, Japan, namely the Germany and Switzerland, Italy, and Japan. And most of them has been the, uh, owned by family, not the stock listed, because the, such a sluggish uh, business of textile machinery, sometimes very big order, sometimes zero order, it's very difficult for us to make the continuous or profit for the stockholders. And uh, we should keep the money at a bad time and uh, try to keep the uh, investment in the uh, R&D and prepare for the good days. That kind of long term and long view is very difficult to main maintain under the public pressure. So that may be one reason why the family business in Asia may have some potential. Right. And it's surviving till third generation, the odds are very low usually, so you've done obviously a good job, but it's one of the big challenges in many markets like a China, India, and even in Korea as well. Paul. Yeah, I just wanted to intro the, the comment on China and India. So having built businesses in both countries and have a learning curve that steep, of course, it's a very humbling experience. China builds highways. 
you, you wake up in the morning and a beautiful highway is built. India doesn't do that well yet because of the bureaucracy and corruption issues. So we always say China builds highways, but India builds virtual highways. So in China you build un unbelievable infrastructure, but you have the Great Firewall, which has tripled. The controls on the Great Firewall have tripled in the last two years. So how do you take this beautiful entrepreneurial energy and this market of 1.4 billion, and yet you restrict their access to knowledge outside in the world. India, on the other hand, has more challenge building the infrastructure, which will improve. But they have complete open internet access to all the knowledge in the world. So when you have this young population in India, and they can leverage that across the world without constraints, I think that becomes a very hidden, uh, hidden tool for India's success long term is the physical bureaucracy, infrastructure is a challenge, but the intellectual uh, position is completely open. So it really matters also how you control the way knowledge moves across the countries in the new economy. Well, India will overtake Japan uh, as number three in the next decade, but I know you feel slightly differently, Sumi. Well, I, I don't. I, I suppose what I'm trying to do is give a, a perspective that um, I'm not as global or, or as macro as Paul or Frank <laughs> or Mickey. I make money by baking, backing entrepreneurial in people with you know, entrepreneurs with good integrity. If you ask me, the success of my business is really finding the right people to back. Always, uh, I, I just gave a speech only uh, two weeks ago in the New South Wales Parliament about SMEs and the problems they face, which is a bit off topic here. But I think there's a big audience here, we can talk about that. The five topics, the five challenges they have, risk capital, available risk capital. You know, you, you don't have enough capital to grow. Getting good people to work with you because you're not a big company, you don't have the resources to pay them. The third one is you're lonely at the top. You're a family-run business. You've got nobody else to talk to. You've got to solve all the problem by yourselves. And the fourth problem is succession. How do you find a succession so that your business becomes sustainable? Most young businesses die within the you know, first generation. Within the first two years, they die because they're not sustainable. So, so what I'm trying to do here is I'm going to contrast Paul and Frank. I'm going to say, on the ground, find me the right people. I'll back you. And the fifth one is networking. That's why I'm here. <laughs> I'm trying to find the people I can match with Australian companies to do things. I find them in Southeast Asia because that's my hometown my, where I was born. Mm -hmm. But the Japanese and Australian SMEs are not getting together. That's like my to, challenge with you. Yeah. Reconcile, reconcile our views, so if I may, ahead. actually. Go ahead, so Frank. I would really back everything you said and, uh, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, all five points. Uh, but what I see sometimes is that, you know, the, the Chinese um, uh, universe, in a way, is not so much looking into the Indian universe and vice versa. Really, there are two different societies. Even like in countries like Indonesia and Thailand, you've got a lot of uh, overseas Chinese um, top entrepreneurs, but also a lot of um, NI entrepreneurs and uh, you know they don't really talk uh, similarly like even in the silicon valley right they're like um, uh, chinese entrepreneurs indian entrepreneurs two different worlds so i think that should join forces so i believe it's not either or not china or india but both and no, i agree frank yeah. it's just questions that i only got 24 hours a day <laughs> There's plenty of growth in asia just yeah in sure sure but then you can double your activities <laughs> if you add on india <laughs> Just building uh, maybe the contrast to the uh, SMEs, what have you seen in your experience around large corporates taking those kind of skills in terms of the flexibility, the adaptability, the right guy letting, you know, letting the right guy or gal do their own thing? It would be great to hear your stories of companies, again, countries, sectors you've been impressed with, but that's sort of at a big scale. Anybody do it well in your mind, Paul? I, I think a great model in the past, but I'm biased with my experience, is Lian Fung. It's a Hong Kong-based company, and they, it, Victor has about 240 companies. But what he did was he took his main company, Virtual Manufacturing, and he compartmentalized it into different groups, and each group is an entrepreneurial network. And the, 
head of that group is incentivized with percentage of the profit, plus shares in the company. So he's literally created hundreds of miniature companies within the, within the bigger group. And so he allows each to run as a very large, it's $22 billion of, of revenue, Lee and Fung Trading, and then there are three other public companies. But he's created a, a kind of a radical hybrid, which is a lot of miniature companies under the bigger corporate group. So you can leverage the power of the corporate group, but you allow each group to be dynamic and creative and to be incentivized. I, I kind of like that hybrid model. Oh, it's a company that I greatly respect. I also have a quick list of um, the top 50 most innovative companies that we track over the years. And interestingly, many of these companies were uh, not big corporates when they started. So the list is the usual suspects. It's Apple, Google, Tesla, Microsoft, Amazon, Netflix, Samsung, Toyota are the two Asian companies that make it to the top 10, followed by Facebook. And over the, I guess, decade or so we've done this research, the Asian companies account for about 10% of the honor roll. And the big corporates that are mentioned are ones from Japan, uh, Korea, and in recently China, Lenovo, Huawei, uh, Tata, to just name a few. So I think there are lessons to be learned. Can I speak yes, about a little bit back to the previous uh, uh, topic, but uh, listening to Sumi and the Frank's the discussion about Asia in the Western way, I think that uh, the, what was the uh, source of the current Asian growth? And I think it's not uh, purely on the Asian, only, I mean, that uh, only Asian uh, power or some uh, expertise or knowledge, but it's kind of a result was stimulated by the Western world. Mm. Some uh, chemistry between the American well business and some Chinese factory, or sometimes even in Japan. Japan's growth are triggered by the World War II after the war. And uh, so I think a very important question is whether the Asia or different part, but uh, some chemistry, some, some uh, uh, stimulus each other. is very simulation is important in that kind of uh, discussion, I think. Yeah. Did you want to come? Yeah, talking think? about uh, workforce and um, you know HR um, employment, I've been to the headquarter of uh, Huawei recently, yeah. and I've seen a lot of foreigners, a lot of young um, Australians, Europeans, Americans, and it's a new trend now, like uh, seeing you know Europeans, Americans, Australians working for Asian companies. Um, so, and, and even when you go to Shanghai these days, you see a lot of um, young Westerners um, founding companies out of Shanghai. Um, and say, you know, where's the be best place to be, to, to be disruptive, to be innovative, and uh, to create your, um, your business. And uh, it's a very interesting linkage here. You, you go where the market is, you go where the inspiration is, you go where the fun is, which is also very important. And it's definitely all happening here in, uh, in Asia. We don't really see it in Europe. Uh, you know, the, the old centers of the past, London, of course, has always been the place, but London has some other issues right now. And uh, so the attention is very much um, focusing uh, to Asia. Talking about leadership, we work a lot with um, Asian leaders, um, and I would like to mention a few, a few companies you already mentioned before, you know, the, like Samsung, um, of course, the, the Toyota model, the Japanese model. Um, we see also a new style of uh, leadership in the Chinese context, you know, very uh, versatile Chinese entrepreneurs um, being, I would say, very pragmatic on the one hand, but also very opportunistic. They go where the market is, they, wear, they go where the opportunities are. Take, for example, um, Hainan Airlines, H&A Group, a very interesting company. I know the owner, uh, 20 years ago, he started with one plane uh, flying from uh, the uh, island of Hainan, uh, Hainan I think, to, to Beijing. Now it's uh, the largest Chinese airline, so the largest domestic airline, and um, I think number two or number three um, after at China and China at Southern globally. And now he's starting to invest. He's using a Warren Buffett type of approach. He just bought 10% of Deutsche Bank. He's looking into uh, Allianz, uh, the German insurance company. Uh, he's buying real estate all around the world, and it's definitely a new trend. And you know, how is Chinese or let's say Asian management different from Western management? Maybe Asians use less business plans that just um, you know go with a gut feeling, uh, very much based on. Um, whom you know, you know the old concept of Guangxi in China or Kone in Japan, um, uh, which um, might be seen as nepotism in some way if you get too close, but it's always good to work with somebody you trust and you know, and that's maybe you know, the difference between Western style and Asian style. You work with people you know, you work with people you, you trust in.
One, one, of, the, one of the challenges we have with tech startups, I, I, I mentor some startups in the Asia region, so many tech startups aren't creating something new out here in Asia. What, what so many of them do is they study what worked in the US, Silicon Valley, and then they realize, oh, it's not out here. And then they create the company to replicate that model, raise capital, bring it to Series A, Series B, and the real goal is to be bought over by one of the big US companies. Or now you have Alibaba, of course, uh, and some others like that also buying over. So we look at maybe, I think study from INSEAD was about 93% of the startups in Asia are replicators. And about 7% are completely radical ideas. So we really culturally, to really leverage the region and the new economy, we have to get more of our startups like Horizon wants to do at Globus. We need to get more of our startups to think radical and what's unique for Asia rather than comfortably replicating what already exists, but bringing it out to Asia. And I think this is still a challenge we have to deal with. Oh, very interesting perspective. Do you want to comment, Cindy? I'm just going to sort of preempt the Q&A time, maybe given the audience here, so to start thinking about what would you like to see Japan SMEs do better? Uh, because I see, for example, Australia and Japan SME should cooperate a lot more. When I go and raise money from the institutional investors, one of my catchphrases is that you play Australia as a second derivative of Asia. We've got the rule of law, we've got you know, very good governance, and we're close to Asia. If you want to be, if you're not sort of that keen about Chinese you know, companies with their lack of transparency, invest in us and we, you get a second delivery of the Asian growth story. Now that sounds a bit slick and it can challenge us on it, but it has been proven. I mean, I, one of some of my better investment 10 years ago was to do with the mining resources boom. And we really did well. And then we tried to do the soft resources, i.e. the protein wealth. And now we're focusing on education, tourism, healthcare, financial services, because the middle class in Asia is looking for that. We all know how good a coffee culture is in Melbourne. Now you find that in Singapore, you find that in Melbourne and in Hong Kong. So soon they're being, in fact, they are in Shanghai and they're in Beijing. And the next thing is you hope you see them in Chengdu. So really, I'm trying to say that there's a lot of opportunities for SMEs, both in, in, in Japan and Australia, to work together. But I haven't seen too many of those. I've seen Hong Kong, I've seen Singaporean, I've seen Malaysian companies coming down looking for opportunities. I mean, that's a great investment thesis and a pitch. I would, however, tell you that in Japan, uh, our, the death rate of small and medium-sized companies is lower than many of the developed markets. We do not let companies go bankrupt in this country, and you can argue you have to fail a few times before you succeed. So if you find some of those that are about to, you know, live a whatever. <laughs> so... Anyway, did, did, did one of you gentlemen want to comment? No? Maybe just in your point uh, on, uh, on services, it's definitely uh, the way to go, right? So like the, the coffee shop culture and um, in general the, the services culture, definitely China has to catch up here. China, a bit like Japan, was very much based on, um, on engineering, on, uh, on manufacturing. And uh, so we see now China is, is shifting towards services in a, in a big way. India was always um, in services, uh, as we lack the, the highways, as Paul said before. Um, so maybe um, what we need here is also a bit of more government vision, like the government leading the way. When you read um, uh, um, China's five years plan, of course, there's a new session pretty soon. I think, uh, you know, services is really at the top, how to... Um, um, shift now the economy towards services um, and, and of course innovation. I think you know those are the two catchwords uh, which go together, and we see we'll see a lot of growth happening here in this um, um, whole uh, services sphere. Great, thank you. Um, we have a Q and A coming up shortly. I'll open it up to the audience. But my final question, which I keep saying I'll come back to, is thinking about Asia in the context business in the context of the geopolitics that are going on. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, would love your comments as business leaders, how you think about managing in this world of uncertainty. I know there's a specific session right next door about this as we speak, but as the world becomes even more uncertain than ever before, 
um, corporate, I talked about corporate death rates of Japanese SMEs, but actually if you take the US uh, corporate death rates of uh, the large corporates of the S&P 500, every five years, a third of them are not listed anymore. They may have been acquired, they may have consolidated, they are not around. So the corporate death rate is accelerating. Geopolitics, arguably, there was some mention of TPP and Trump and who knows what's gonna happen at the UN today. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, what is your view around how business leaders should navigate in this time of uncertainty from an Asian perspective? Uh, my one word is really, I'm not going to sweat about things that I can't do anything about. <laughs> um, I think whether it's Mr. Trump or somebody else, I, I feel, in a way, what, what the Ambassador Dick said and McCormick say is quite right. There are enough checks and balances in the US government system that I don't think, you know, we're just going to hear a lot of press about him. But so far, in fact, two months ago, I start, stopped reading about him because there ain't <laughs> nothing you can do about it. Just move on. So that's what I, I just said. That you just had to get on with it. Good words of wisdom. Don't sweat it. Frank? Um, I think, you know, uh, still there's a few, few concerns um, um, uh, up here. And um, I share your optimism. I think business leaders are doing very well here in Asia. Um, we talked about the Asian approach to entrepreneurship and disruption. But um, um, really, you know, the big elephant in the room is geopolitics. And I'm very concerned to tell the truth about Korea and what uh, the Korean uh, Peninsula conflict means here for the region, especially for Japan, uh, seeing another rocket flying over, um, and, um, and this will actually impact the whole region, even down to Australia, because you will feel the impact, uh, maybe not um, the military impact, but the, the economic impact, and this is a major, major you know, risk for, for all of us. I will be in Korea in a couple of days' time, and uh, I'm a little bit afraid <laughs> to go there, uh, because if you think about how close Seoul is to the border, right, and if anything happens and um, something unplanned, and, um, you know, you don't really know how Mr. Trump is reacting or the dear leader, and it's not only Korea, of course, we got also the South China Sea, we got the conflict between uh, Pakistan and India, uh, so it's not a very certain region, I have to say, so we need more dialogue, uh, we need more... Uh, coexistence, um, and uh, I think countries like Australia can lead the way, you know, you're, you're neutral, you're safe, you've got the rule of law, and uh, we need to have to apply the thinking to the whole region. I was in Korea when the missile went over, actually, in Seoul, meeting with some clients, and a CEO told me that the man in the north, Miksan, don't worry, he's uh, uh, crazy, but not stupid. So th then I flew back home that day. But anyway, <laughs> Munasa-san, your okay. thoughts about geopolitics. The, the growth, growth is important. But the growth is not a goal. Growth is just a result of our effort to keep our employees and customers happy. Paul? Yeah, you know, first, North Korea. Frank, you could explain that well, because you've been in North Korea twice. A very unique vantage point. I, you know, we were just at this incredibly exciting time with Asia, TPP integrating, the whole trading mechanism, including intellectual property mm -hmm. rights, Japan entering, opening up agriculture. And with that movement, it was a matter of time before China would have, would have joined that with proper rules of engagement. So just everything was moving in the right direction. And then disruption, right? And the Trump administration leaving TPP is, is the worst thing the U.S. could do. It's so bad for Asia, and it's devastating. Uh, and I hope in three and a half years we'll correct that mistake. Um, and then Brexit will have an impact. So the next 10 years will be the biggest transformation economically in the history of the world. With AI, with robotics, with IoT. We have never experienced a transformation, I think, most of our business leaders and political leaders are not anywhere close to being prepared to deal with this change of disruption. How many jobs will be destroyed as we move to robotics, as AI comes in? Uh, we're not planning for this effectively. You know, and, and, and I, I just came back from B20 Task Force G20. We were talking about this for 10 months. Most of our leaders, my concern is CEOs are rewarded for two to three year windows. We, c we have to think longer term as business leaders, whether you're SME or you're in a large corporation. The next five to 10 years is the biggest transformation in the history of the world. 
and we are not thinking about how to transition collectively. And that's my biggest concern. And, it, and then any political event, whether it's North Korea or the South China Sea or, or Trump, Trump political games, um, that worries me. Now, years ago, I worked in the US Senate. So I am very confident that we have checks and balances. And you're already seeing them at work, right? So it can be very messy. It can be a little embarrassing. But the checks and balances will keep the US in equilibrium. But globally, we all need to change the way we're thinking about how we're going to move into the new economy. And I think that's a separate discussion. Thank you, Paul. So we've had about 45 minutes together. We've talked about disruption, digital, technology, innovation. We talked about regions, countries, cities, and the channels that connect them. We talked about small companies and big companies and what each may learn from each other, and then the unique leadership traits of Asian corporates, perhaps, versus the West, and unique Asian innovation. And we talked about services to manufacturing. But there's probably a lot more that we can talk about. I thought I would open it up to all of you to see if you have any questions for uh, any of the specific panelists or general question. Yes, sir. Thank you. Pei Emerson, coming from Sweden. Uh, have been here with offices in Japan since 1980 and in, 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 in uh, uh, China since 1992. One question, disruption. You remember how it was in the airline industry in the 60s and the 70s, when everything was regulated? Compare that to education of today, one of the areas where politicians believe they had to decide most of it. Question, how do you see the future in Asia with a rapid change in disrupting traditional education and opening up for competition and making sure that you get skilling to everyone in Asia? Which country will be the first to understand the market dynamics in education? It's a great question. And um, Globus Hori San is a great example of trying to change the way education is done. I'm, I'm on the board of a US school and also an Indian business school. And we're having the discussion because the entire way we've designed education is based on an old economy of over 100 years ago. The US, you know, the university system, which is as good as it is, we're now realizing that lectures need to be online and then the students need to interact when they're in the classroom because just sitting in a classroom and hearing a lecture is old economy. And, and so the whole way we teach education is a critical part of transforming the economy. The, the entire education system is in an old model when, to your point, I, and it's a great question, we need to redesign the education and having a central government just, just design it, we need more experiments in, in learning methodologies. And, 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 and you know, now, now with AI, we actually can customize for individuals what they learn and how they learn. So we have to completely rethink uh, the way we teach people, the way we lecture, the way we engage them, because most of the students today, we need to prepare for jobs that don't exist. We're preparing them for jobs that we don't even know what those jobs will be in, in 10 or 20 years from now. So there, there are good starting examples in that space, but we have a long way to go, and we don't have a lot of time to make that transformation. It's a great question. That's a quick add-on. I think, you know, uh, great question again, Paige, and I think I know how much you're focusing on education in your business. Uh, usually when we talk about education, we talk about um, universities, colleges, you know, like you in Australia, you um, serve the rest of Asia and uh, developing the leaders, but education starts much earlier. I think we should focus on primary schools and secondary schools and, you know, develop um, the kids uh, uh, and make them ready for disruption. And the traditional education system, actually, you know, in the schooling system means you go to school every day and then you leave it uh, in the afternoon, you go back. It's very old-fashioned in a way. And uh, what we should have uh, uh, is an exchange system, sending the kids all around Asia, all around the world to learn from different cultures and say, why not spending a year in India or spending a year in China? And of course, do a lot of online education on the primary and secondary school uh, level already. Yeah, well, and, and, and Frank, I just wanted to add, you know, sorry to interrupt this, I apologize, but reverse mentoring. So we're discussing in Singapore, we need CEOs to hire young, bright people and have those young, bright people teach them. 
So our CEOs are, are so high level, but we, we need to start reverse mentoring where the bright young students coming out with social media and all these new ideas, we need to learn that as CEOs. So we, we need to flip the whole education method in corporations as well. Another question? Gentleman in the back, if you can say your name and where you're from, please. Thank you. Hi, my name is Carl Burrow. I'm from the U.S. Um, I'm, a, I'm an adjunct professor at Keio University where I teach uh, business model innovation, human-centered design, and design thinking, um, and transformation. And I run a company that does strategy consulting in Tokyo Innovation. Um, a couple of points, a couple of questions I want to address to uh, especially to uh, President Murata, CEO. Uh, I followed your company for some time, and, um, and also the gentleman there on the left, okay? Um, I want to talk about disruption because I've heard all day a lot of people use the word disruption, and I think it's, it's been taken out of context. And um, the questions that I want to address to all of you is that when we think about this. Disruption. I, I tend to think that based on my analogy of it and my, my foresight and scenario planning that I've done in this area is that I think disruption basically limits an organization. And when I say that, I, say, I, I mean to say that basically when, 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 when large companies focus on disruption, limits themselves, they should be focusing on new opportunities and new markets instead of focus on disruptance. Because in some instances, some companies get into the market where they're not disrupting anything. Like, like the billion dollar person to pay industry. It didn't disrupt anything, okay? Uh, microfinance, it didn't disrupt anything. It provided a new opportunity for, for communities um, for poverty. Um, the other point that I wanted to make is that, uh, you know, I've used the word companies need to focus on sustainable, maintaining a sustainable competitive advantage. Well, I think companies need to go beyond that, continue to look for new opportunities in the market. Um, and, that, and therefore, when we, when we use that terminology, it gives, it gives startups and entrepreneurs a platform to actually create new startups and new companies that don't focus on just one job, but look at a platform that covers every job. And so this is why you have the failure of startups. Um, and it's so slow. So if I so, may, I think as a fellow consultant, so, I completely believe in competitive advantage. Okay. Is your question, so, growth doesn't necessarily come from disruptive moves, it can actually come from right next door? It could, it could. And it may, yeah. and, and, so, and, so I just want to translate yes. it to a question so the gentleman yes. can answer. And so, yes? and so the question that I'm getting at is that basically, um, I believe that companies, large companies need to focus on exponential growth 10 times in creating new business models and new markets, okay? Because there they create new opportunities and new markets. And I want to get your perception and your view on that. Instead of focusing on disruption, but also, but just looking on new opportunities in the market. But as I noticed that um, what, um, what Dr. Seisak Show does, as I said, I've been following the company, they don't focus on disruption all the time. They focus on um, creating new opportunities in the markets when they get into the market. So it could be a definition around what's yes. disruptive yes. or what feels, you know, kind of next exactly. door, but it's actually exactly. you know, going visiting your neighbor actually may be quite disruptive. So Absolutely. I don't know if uh, any of the gentlemen want to take that question. Yeah. First of all, our companies are not the Murata manufacturing, uh, which is the e-component large company, the Murata machinery, making a machinery anyway. Uh, the, as Paul mentioned, we are in the midst of the large change, a lot of changes in the IoT and the industry 4.0, robotics, AI, and uh, so many sources of the disruption and the change. And uh, I think that uh, we can't help uh, avoiding from that. So day-to-day -day business, just following day-to-day -day business under the new environment of technology can lead you for something new, I believe. Maybe without do, trying to doing something very different, listening to your customer and facing your employees and decide what you should do, just automatically, I believe, to bring you to the new field. And so many a change in the paradigm shift and uh, a lot of sources of change outside. You don't have to try to create inside. That's my belief. 
Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Um, my name is Annette Kimmett. I'm a global head of uh, growth markets for EY. Your, your comment on looking outside of the business for innovation doesn't all have to come from inside. Just interested if um, anybody on the panel has seen really great examples of companies that do that, that have really um, seized uh, disruptive innovation, not from inside itself, but from staying very connected to the global ecosystem of startups. Have you got any good examples of where you've seen that? Yeah. Work do you remember well? the uh, brand name Murata as a fax machine in 1990s? <laughs> we are uh, number one seller in the States, by the way, at that time. <laughs> but uh, suddenly, the internet came, email came, and the fax market uh, disappeared. Mm -hmm. Such a large paradigm shift. And uh, we focused to the, uh, try to shift these engineers from the fax machine uh, production in design to the other industrial machineries. So that helped us to move to this different stage. But all the change came from the outside. Without the internet and uh, uh, email, our company would have been a large global company. <laughs> I think I'll just add that I, I think we are, we are not that far apart of the things we're talking about here. A business to survive, especially SME, you have to you never stop innovating to improve your business. Give you an example again, I talk about Lorna Jane. Everyone knows retail sector is going a structural change at the moment. I think Australia is following the US that we are over shopping mall and, and people are stopped going to the, the food for traffic in almost every shopping mall in, the, in Australia is falling as well, decreasing. So year on year sales in the physical stores are falling. And I can tell you that every board meeting we're coming out with new ideas about how to give the retailer and the, the retail customers a better experience. Hey, we never innovate so much in our bloody life. Mm -hmm. To stay alive, just to stay alive. So I, I have to say this, this disruption thing can be a bit too much of a lingo, but businesses, good businesses to stay alive is an innovator, full stop. Simple as that, speak or small. I think all change, in a way, comes from the outside, right? So we are forced to change, we are forced to think, we are forced to go beyond the routine. That's why we innovate. And I think disruption is just a buzzword to describe it, right? And, and I wouldn't say, you know, one is disruptive, one is not. It's more like a connotation or the taste you want to give to it. But uh, yes, most of change comes from the outside. And why are entrepreneurs um, starting business in, in countries like India or some poorer countries out of pure necessity because there's nothing else, there's no large company to work for, there's no government to work for, so you have to innovate and create your company. Again, you know, that's, that's why maybe we in Europe are a bit um, complacent. Uh, you know, there, there's a lot of, you know, there are a lot of jobs opportunities and it's the reason we, we miss out in innovation and disruption, right? Because everything is in a very cozy environment, so we don't need to to uh, innovate and disrupt. Any other questions? Hi, my name is Ken Watanabe. Um, good discussion over um, a disruption, I think. And uh, my question is, in order to be destructive, um, probably we need to be decentralize uh, the system. Right, but on the other hand, uh, like uh, uh, discussion over education, um, still government needs to play some role, right? So from uh, you guys' business perspective, uh, what kind of role can uh, each of the government can play? I, I, you know, I'm, I'm in a unique place, Singapore. Singapore is very unique because they allow us as foreign business leaders to serve on advisory committees with the government. And they actually say, I mean, I, I love this model. I'm very biased, I have to admit. And the Singapore says, oh, you're, you, they mix us on a committee. And then they say, let us share with you our 10 or 15 year plan of where we want to take Singapore in finance or in logistics or other areas. And then they say, here are some of the things we're looking at. They bring in top consultants like Boston Consulting Group and, and McKinsey. And then, they, and then they say, now as business leaders with different backgrounds, what do you think? What should we change? And, and I think this is a superb uh, way of, of using government to 
have a long-term strategy to think how to play with tax policies and education and all of these things. And while they're developing the strategy, they bring in business leaders and, and, and you have signed a confidentiality agreement and they actually share with you some classified information. And they make you part of creating the solution and then you feel so committed. And, and again, a lot of what Singapore will do will actually happen in other countries like China and India and, and ASEAN region. But it, it's, a, it's a thought leadership center. And I would like to see more governments creating that kind of model because government plays a critical role with strategy and, and, and tax policy and, and regulations and it makes or breaks the whole business. But to allow business leaders academic leaders to be part of that process, not only with lobbyists, but actually as internal partners, it, it's a beautiful thing. Singapore, we have a, the trade union now has a committee where they've mixed 10 business leaders, the union, a cabinet minister, and they actually say, uh, we're worried about employment in the future. How do we prepare the new generation? And how do we retrain mid-career people? And, and you're actually part of developing this on a voluntary basis. I would love to see that in India, to have a task force with outside talent blended. I, I think that's a great model of how a partnership can be built. I'm going to take the antichrist view here. I think Singapore is done to death. Uh, unfortunately, in the Western democracy, we don't have Singapores. We don't. And in Australia, for the last 15 years, I've told my investors, because I was in Singapore and I was in, in the UAEs, I said, here in the UAEs in Singapore, the government said, what can we do to help to business? In Australia, for the last 15 years, businesses will get on in spite of the government. And we have to live with that. This is democracy. It is democracy. You can't have a sectorial sort of preferences. And in a way, in Australia, big businesses now is really on the nose. Because of inequality, because of big pay for CEOs, political suicide if any government wants to go and favor the big businesses. That's populism at the moment. So I'm saying to you realistically, in a developed economy like Australia and Japan and the US, forget about Singapore. You're never going to replicate it. So don't go there. Sorry, Paul. No, no. And, 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 and to have the debate, though, because, yeah, exactly. because I, I like US. We love answer. that. We all love it. I can tell you how many times I hear Australian businessmen, oh, I wish Lee Kuan Yew was born here. I wish Lee Forget it. It's not going to happen. No, no, but, but if I can it's not correct. Happen. You're Malaysian, right? You're you, you know, <laughs> but to your so, point, so, when you go to Silicon Valley, that is the best environment of all, right? When you go to Silicon Valley, it's, it's a misogynist, just, sexist culture. That e everything has is radical in Silicon Valley. But, some but, are but we have too many big companies lobbying and controlling government policy in the US, in Europe, in Australia. So, no, I'm not saying we want government control. I, I want to see large companies that control 15% of the job market not controlling the policies for the whole country. But if you ask me the perfect place, I still like Silicon Valley. Sometimes uh, regulation is important. And very strong regulation in Japan for safety. Sometimes train companies to, to the ability to come up with a safer product. But too much regulations prevent us to make uh, some experiments at the uh, real world. For example, we are developing uh, some transportation robot inside the hospital. But in Japan, it's very difficult to implement as an experiment. We are doing it in Singapore at this time. So some uh, special area to be allowed for the manufacturer to, to try something is uh, to deregulate. De Sometimes I think it's important. But basically, strong regulation, in most of the case, train cooperation, I think. I, I, just last word, because I'm sorry we got one minute. So last comment, so two comments. One, sharing with you the Australian experience. I think the, when, I, when you talk about school, when you talk about education, I like to segment it, because from zero to 12, year 12, or I don't know what the equivalent, it's a life-forming experience. It's learning to be a community. It's learning to love learned. This thing about job skilling is post-schooling. It's, it's tertiary. And that is a different ball game. So I think it's very important to have a good cultural value-driven school system that the parents are involved with, that the government are supporting. And I think getting it right is maximum. And I think most countries get it right. So I don't think we need to, that, that disruption there 
they don't need you to tell them. They, they're playing with their smartphones and their iPads before you know it. So I'm not worried about that. And the other experience I'd like to share with you is that Australia is in a way quite a unique situation because it's a migrant-built country like me. So the affinity with Asia is built into the system. I'm full of hope for Australia because my children's generation, the cohorts, yes, they were, they were, they were bullied as an as a Asian, but they're integrated to society. They're going to contribute. My daughter works in Beijing, but she wants to call Sydney home. She'll come home and she'll add to their engagement with Asia. And I think Japan needs to think about it sometime because you have a wonderful homogeneous society here. I love you for it. But your disadvantage is that you're homogeneous as well. Thank it's you. a very interesting place to stop. I'm afraid we're out of time. But we did actually not talk about the uh, talent challenge as much per se. Mm -hmm. And I think it's a very good reminder. It's very clear all four gentlemen here are passionate about growth in Asia. Uh, but even in China, we're going to have labor shortages. And so grooming the next generation of entrepreneurs that will help the growth, I think, will be the challenge for all of us here. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you to the gentlemen on the panel.